Thanks, Thanks Davey. Oh, man. Good morning, Miss Yo. Happy Sunday. Oh, man. You know, the worst part about uh, being told that your announcements are long is having to go up and then preach afterward with everybody being like, oh, no. But it's okay. I'm not Scott. <laughs> uh, good morning, Miss Yo. Happy Sunday. You know, the Summer Olympics have started. Anybody watching the Olympics? Anybody who's like, oh, yeah, Olympic fans. There's a couple of you in the room that are like, gymnastics, wow. And a few of you are like, what? <laughs> um, they started, I remember I was watching the opening ceremony on Friday night. Kaylee is just like the biggest fan of the Olympics. She loves the Olympics. And she was like, we have to make sure we have Peacock so we can be watching the Olympics. We need it. And so we were starting to watch the Olympics on Friday night. And uh, we're seeing the opening ceremony. And by far, the greatest moment of that, in my opinion, is the close of the ceremony with Celine Dion. If you saw any of that, it was so cool. Although the metal opera part was also really cool. That was pretty sick. Um, but I I've been a Celine Dion fan probably since the time I saw a music video of her song, I'm Alive, uh, that was in the special uh, edition DVD of Stuart Little 2. Um, I can't believe if people remember that. <laughs> You know, the reason this was such a humo huge moment for Celine Dion, I say Celine like I know her, um, this huge moment for her at the Olympics performing this was this was the first time that she has performed since March of 2020. Um, and in, Mar and in uh, 2022, uh, she announced that she was diagnosed with a disease called stiff person syndrome, an autoimmune disorder that causes her body to lock up and her voice to shut down where she cannot speak or sing. And the only way that she's been able to get through this, which she, there is no cure for it, what she's been doing is uh, five days a week since 2022, every single week she has been doing physical exercise, um, physical therapy, and vocal coaching to relearn how to speak and relearn how to sing. And so the moment of absolute triumph for her is being able to perform here at the Olympics, and then not only do that, but to be able to overcome such, an, uh, such a powerful disease in her life and show and uh, inform everybody that even though that has been putting her voice down, she still has an incredibly powerful voice. We're, what a really cool story. And that's kind of the whole purpose of the Olympics. There's so many cool stories that we see come out of this of people triumphing in different ways. And it's just a powerful moment of endurance showcasing how someone's voice can make such a huge impact. Today we're jumping into Elijah's story in 1 Kings chapter 19, and we're focusing on a few different voices. Uh, we're going to be focusing on the voice of Queen Jezebel who mocks God. Um, we're going to focus on the voice of Elijah's inner monologue, how he fears the cries of Jezebel, and ultimately the still small voice of God, a whisper that brings Elijah back from the brink of despondency. So if you got your Bible with you, go ahead and open it to 1 Kings chapter 19. A little backstory here. This is following one of Elijah's greatest triumphs in ministry. Um, Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 18, he goes against uh, 700 priests of Baal and prophets of Baal who um, Elijah essentially challenges them. He says, hey, if you guys want, let's put your God up against my God and let's see who wins. And so they go out into the desert, and all these priests and prophets of Baal, they bring tons and tons of water with them um, that Elijah then commands that they pour onto this altar after they've spent all day um, doing horrific things of crying out to Baal, cutting themselves and mutilating their bodies, hoping that their God will respond. And then Elijah says, hey, all the water you brought with you, which Israel was in a drought at the time, so all the water they brought with them would have been all the water they had to survive on not only the trip there, but the trip back. And so they basically said, okay, we're willing to die here. And so they pour all this water out onto, onto the altar as Elijah commands them to do because they are so convinced that God won't show up, that they were willing to die to prove the point. And then God shows up and fire pours down from heaven. It consumes not only the water and steam shoots up everywhere, it consumes the wood of the altar, it consumes the sacrifices on the altar, it consumes the stones of the altar a huge display of God's power and miracle. And Elijah has the highest point of his ministry career. And then everything changes. And it doesn't seem fair. And we're in 1 Kings chapter 19, starting in verse 1. 
King Ahab told Queen Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he, Elijah, was afraid. And he arose and he ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. And he left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came and he sat down under a broom tree. He asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. He laid down, he slept under the broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate, and he drank, and he laid down again. In verse 7, And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. He arose, he ate, he drank. He went in the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. There he came to a cave, he lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. He said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper, a still small voice. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak, and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Ebel Mohala. That was tough. You shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death, and the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Um, several weeks ago, last month, we went, to, uh, we went to summer camp. The theme for summer camp was isolation. Now, um, if you don't know the role that Missio plays in summer camp, we build all the curriculum that the students and youth will be taught at this camp. Um, and so we come up with the theme of the camp, the scriptures that are preached upon. Um, we come up with the discussion questions, everything that goes into the cabin time discussions, everything that goes into um, when a student is asked to go out and do a devotional time on their own. And everything was themed around this idea of isolation. Uh, really, the co concept of it was Jesus is the solution to your isolation. The whole inspiration of this theme came to me through 1 Kings chapter 19. The story of Elijah in isolation, desperate for death, and God's rescue of him in that moment. Ironically, it was the one story we didn't speak on at camp because there was just so much that we wanted to emphasize about Christ that this story didn't fit the mold exactly right. However, I knew that God was working in me for that. I knew that God was working in me through this, through this text, and he kept, he kept having me wrestle with it a little bit, so hopefully 1 Kings 19 hits you in a way that it hit me. I remember when pursuing my undergrad, um, I started off at uh, Chandler Gilbert Community College. I did two years there. 
Um, I took all my prerequisites and I took all my electives because I wanted to save as much money as I could before I transferred to university at GCU. So I just took a bunch of crap electives. I, I took rock culture and music history. It has nothing to do with, the, with my degree, but I took it. And you know what? It was fun. That was a cool class. Um, I took a class called The Art of Storytelling. And you know what? If you ever wonder, wow, Davey's really good at uh, storytelling, it's because I studied it in college. <laughs> um, but I remember this class really specifically because it met on Saturday afternoons, the one day of the week that Chandler Gilbert Community College was closed. Um, but it had to meet on Saturday afternoons. And it met in one of their small theater rooms um, where we all sat on the floor on pillows in a circle and we essentially just talked about what makes a good story a good story. And we told stories and we learned how do you tell it better. And I remember my professor, he was this practicing Orthodox Jewish man, which was partly why we met on Saturdays because the class should have met on Fridays, but he didn't want to make sure that he was um, outside of the Sabbath. And so Saturday afternoons instead. So partly why we met on Saturdays, he was also paraplegic, which is why we all sat on the floor in a big circle. One of the primary concepts of storytelling is one called the hero's journey. It, uh, is a story, it's an idea first coined by Joseph Campbell. Um, it details a model of storytelling that we're all extremely used to. Um, it's a model of storytelling um, that novelists will utilize in order to make captivating stories um, and it comes from the way stories are portrayed in ancient Near Eastern mythology and religious texts and in large part by the Bible. Uh, it seems that God knows best how to tell a good story. This method is employed by J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. It's employed by C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, George Lucas's Star Wars, uh, J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter, George R.R. Martin's Game of Thrones, Rick Riordan's Percy Jackson and the Olympians. Um, it's even employed by Stephanie Meyer's Twilight Saga. Not everybody does it well. <laughs> Twilight Saga, by the way, was my dad's favorite movie series. Could you imagine walking in a room of a 65 or 70 year old man and he's just like, Davy, look, she's going to become a vampire. <laughs> <laughs> uh. In the hero's journey, we find this common scene. The hero, which in our case is Elijah, faces their most intense ordeal, the prophets of Baal, the big bad. They are victorious. They reap the reward of that only to return home and realize that their battle is not yet over. The hero then deals with these two things. He deals with the mindset in the battle and the mindset in the aftermath. The mindset of the battle, as Elijah faces, is this. He has this incredible commitment to Yahweh. A commitment to Yahweh. In the mindset in the battle, Elijah is so committed to following God that he's willing to put everything on the line. He's so committed to Yahweh that he's willing to put everything out there and say, hey, how about we put Baal up against Yahweh and see who wins? In 1 Kings 18, Elijah is so confident in his God. Elijah is so committed. Elijah is so ready. He has this idea that there is no way he can lose. He's walking in victory. He has a fight over flight mentality. And it's, it's a really interesting thing because when Elijah walks in this victory, he seems to, he has this moment where he decides, you know what, I, I know that God is going to win. And it's like everything that Elijah is setting up for himself is, is happening just as planned, right? He shows up, he says, okay, bring all your prophets, bring all your priests, Go ahead, do everything. He mocks Baal. He says things like, oh, maybe, well, he's, maybe he's just asleep. You should cry out louder. Perhaps, he'll, perhaps you just need to wake him up. Maybe he doesn't hear you. Perhaps Baal's hard of hearing this time of year. He's walking in victory. And God shows up. He consumes the altar. He consumes the stones. And the prophets, they, they fall in, in obedience to God, and they all are killed for their disobedience and their idolatry. And we have this moment where Elijah 
in the battle doesn't even assume the idea of loss. He doesn't even assume the idea that there is a possibility of losing. He has such a great commitment to God, and he walks in this victory, and then God, Yahweh, is proven by his miracles. God shows up, and in a miraculous moment, Israel knows that Baal is false and Yahweh is triumphant. And they know that they're done for. Imagine Elijah in his mind in this moment. I could just imagine the, the, the puffed up chest of see, see what I've done, see what we have proven to you. Elijah shows a great display of expectation. Elijah shows a great display of expectation. It, it comes from 1 Kings 18. Um, there's a moment where Elijah, immediately following this incredible miracle of God, he decides, you know what I got to do? I got I to see the king. I got to see the queen. I, I got I to gotta see them. I got to see their faces. Hey, you ever have the moment where, like, you're in an argument, and you win the argument, and then you just kind of lean in a little bit because you just really want to see their face, just this face of defeat of like, I win. No one would admit to that, right? Cool. This is just me. <laughs> First Kings 18, 46. This is Elijah leaning in, ready just to look in their face and be like, I win. The hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he gathered up his, gar his garment, and he ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. What you need to understand is Jezreel is the capital of the kingdom of Israel at this point in time. With the kingdom divided, there is the place of Judah, but there's also the kingdom of Israel, and the kingdom of Israel's capital is Jezreel. Elijah has this incredible expectation of the Lord. He expects that God is going to show up so well that he runs to the entrance of Jezreel. He runs to the capital. He is ready. He's expecting when he runs in. Oh, I'm going to run in. I'm going to see the Israelites all bowing before God. I'm going to run in there and the Israelites are going to be so just absolutely distraught. They're going to all be begging for mercy because they're, they know word has traveled so fast. They know that everybody who went out there is not coming back with me. So when I come back alone, they know that God won and he runs into Jezreel. And he proves that Yahweh is the Lord of judgment. He has this moment where he's running in there and he's saying, See, you lose. God wins. There's nothing wrong with this. This is, a, this is his mindset in the battle. This is, this is what's going through Elijah's head. He's committed to Yahweh. He's, he's victorious. He's proving that God exists by these miracles. He, he's expecting God to continue doing more. God shows up in judgment. And Elijah runs into the capital expecting Israel to be ready to receive judgment. He runs in there and he's like, yeah, you're, you're done for. But that's not what happens. You get to the second point, which is this, the mindset in the aftermath. Elijah's gone through the battle. He's victorious. He's returned home. And home isn't what he's expected. He gets to Israel and the people, they, they don't care. No one's falling down on their faces, crying out, save me. He, he gets to Israel. He's at the entrance. He beats the king, Ahab. If you notice back in that verse 46 of chapter 18, it says that he outruns Ahab to the capital. The king is trying to get there. Elijah runs faster. He gets there first. He's ready. He's like, I need to tell the people what really happened. I don't know. Maybe he doesn't trust King Ahab. Maybe he thinks Ahab's going to lie about it. I don't know. But he gets there, and no one cares. He gets there, and no one's, no one's bowing in worship before Yahweh. No one's begging for forgiveness. No one's doing anything. He gets there, and people are still doing their normal everyday life. I had this incredible moment of ministry out in the middle of the desert. And when I get back and you see that I was right, you don't care. Israel shows continuously a rejection of Yahweh. 
It's the moment where Elijah shows up on the scene. He beats everybody to the capital. By the time Ahab catches up, Elijah's just standing there tapping his foot. Come on. Go on. Go tell, go tell Jezebel. Go tell, her what, go tell her what happened. Go on. You get to chapter 19, verse 1. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. And Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more also if I don't make your life as one of them by this time tomorrow. What? That's not, that's not what's supposed to happen. That's not, what, that's not what I've worked for. That's not, what, that's not what my expectation was. That's not what I was doing. No, I ran here. I outran Ahab. And I got here first because I was ready to see you fall on your knees and cry out for mercy. And instead, you don't even have the guts to face me. You send a messenger to me at the, fr- at the front entrance of the capital to tell me that you're going to kill me because your rejection of Yahweh is equal to my commitment to him. Jezebel doesn't care. Israel doesn't care what Elijah did. They don't care that God showed up. Elijah stands there at the gates of the capital, ready to anoint a new king, ready to be prepared for all that God is going to do, and God isn't praised God isn't accepted. He's rejected instead. God isn't... There's two things we need to understand about this rejection of Yahweh. The first thing is the victorious will always proclaim the glory of God. Elijah runs there ready. He runs there ready to say, God wins. You need to know that God wins. Elijah runs there and he's saying, you need to realize that God wins and you need his mercy. You need his grace. And Elijah runs into there and he says to an Israel that rejects Yahweh, to a world that rejects God, he says, listen, God has defeated your idols. God has defeated death. God has defeated all things. He is the victorious God. He comes in judgment, beg for his mercy. Not only does Elijah proclaim this, but so does Ahab. Even the defeated proclaim the glory of God. Ahab goes to Jezebel and says, what are we going to do? Yahweh wins. Do we turn? Do we flee? Do we leave Israel behind and just whoever's still faithful to God stays here and then we'll just get out and find a whole new place? What do we do? Even in this moment, Elijah may not be realizing it, but God's glory is being proclaimed. Elijah may not realize with his great expectation of what is to be, but God's glory is being proclaimed not only by him, but by those whom God has defeated. There is one thing when Elijah walks into the capital and people are nervous. It's another thing when Ahab walks in and there's no one else with him. Everybody in Israel suddenly knows, okay, Yahweh is the real deal. God wins. But Elijah doesn't take it that way. Elijah doesn't see the glory. Elijah only sees the defeat. Elijah only sees the aftermath of this incredible battle and nothing to show for it. Elijah, this next point, he says that it's the end of his ministry. Elijah thinks he's done. It's, it's weird because a lot of scholars will debate this. They'll wonder, okay, there must be some mistranslation here. Um, because when you, get to, when you get to verse 3, and Elijah's afraid, he runs for his life. When you get to verse 4, where he leaves his servant behind, that leaving his servant behind is an abandonment of his ministry. Saying, you stay here and I'll go on by myself, is Elijah saying, I'm done. 
I have nothing else for you to serve. Elijah quits. He goes off another day's journey further from where he leaves his, his ministry companion, where he leaves his servant. Elijah's at the end of his rope. He is scared, and it just seems so out of character. I mean, everything we've read about Elijah, he seems so confident, so bold, so strong. He goes out there and he mocks Baal. He goes out there and he calls for these. He faces alone 700 priests and prophets of Baal by himself. And he has all the confidence in the world. In the mindset of the battle, he doesn't care. I'll fight. I'll keep fighting. And once I've won, I'm going to run back and there's going to be victory. And when he doesn't see it, when he doesn't see God meeting his expectations, man, suddenly all that confidence falls away. When he sees God not showing up the way that he thought God would show up, all that boldness just melts. And Elijah is now just this weak, concerned, sad, depraved man who's wishing and wanting nothing else but for death. He's depressed. He's afraid. Scholars look at that. They go, there must be some sort of mistranslation because how could Elijah ever be afraid? How could Elijah ever flee? Why would he, he hasn't run from anything in the entire, but now he runs? What we need to realize is Jezebel's killed the Lord's prophets before. We get a glimpse of this in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 13. Obadiah, who's distraught and being encouraged by Elijah in this moment. Elijah is being to Obadiah what God is to Elijah in this story. So in 1 Kings 18, 13, Obadiah says, Has it not been told, my Lord, what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord? How I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifties in a cave, and I fed them with bread and water. Obadiah makes it clear, Elijah, she's killed before. She'll do it again. I had to run last time. There's a moment where Elijah comforts Obadiah in his fear, another prophet of God. Yet here in verse 3 of chapter 19, Elijah is feeling the same fear Obadiah once felt. It isn't uncommon. It isn't uncommon for someone who's in the service of the Lord to be afraid. It isn't something where you look at it and you go, oh, that's not the right character trait. I think that's something that we do. We, we look at the story, we go, oh, that's not right for Elijah to do. But we do it every day. Every day when there's that moment where we have to be bold and speak up for our faith, where we go, oh, no, I don't know if I want to do that. And we feel the fear of judgment. We feel the fear of God being mocked. We feel the fear of someone saying, well, I don't want you in my life then if you're going to be this Christian Bible-thumping person. It isn't uncommon for a person who's in ministry and in service of the Lord to have fear. Elijah flees, leading to our next point. He's now walking in defeat, flight over fight. It's interesting because a lot of Christians tend to wrestle with this. I mean, how could Elijah go from the highest moment of his ministry to the lowest moment in just a few words spoken by his enemy? It, it seems baffling, but it's just so common, isn't it? The highest moments of our lives tend not to be followed by a steady plateau or even a steady decline, but more often than not, a vast crash into despondency. More often than not, it's due to our dependence being upon the climb itself. We have the hope that we may reach further and higher than before, and we've reached the peak, and we see that we can go no further. There's nowhere else to go but down again. And the high points of life, as great as they are, tend to remind us the ever-true message of Ecclesiastes that apart from God, all is meaningless. And you can go from these high moments of excellence to these low moments of depravity. Think about this. Elijah just completes his greatest act of ministry in his entire career. The final act, he presumes, is God's miraculous victory over Baal and the priests of Baal. Elijah is so sure of this that he sprints into the capital, ready to see the king and queen fall to their knees and beg for God's mercy. Elijah is expecting the uproar of the Israelites to chase after him into the palace and hold up the king and the queen and say, put their heads on sticks 
we need to do this. Elijah is still in the mindset of the battle, but once he shifts to the mindset of the aftermath, Israel is not what he expects it to be in this moment. You can really picture it. The moment of the hero's journey, the hero comes home. Elijah comes home from this great battle. He expects the defeated king. He expects the idolatrous, evil queen Jezebel to fall on their knees and beg for forgiveness. Imagine the confusion when he rushes into the kingdom. He sees the Israelites still worshiping Baal, still kissing golden calves. He sees them still going about their business as if nothing of worth has occurred. God's glory is declared, but for some reason the world doesn't care. Imagine investing in a member of your family and seeing no evidence of growth in their life. Pouring time, energy, finances into a person who is seeking guidance and nothing is clicking with them yet. Imagine praying for God to move in someone's life Day after day after day, nothing. Imagine wishing and wanting and waiting for that one broken relationship to finally be resolved and forgiveness to be had and restoration to be gained and still nothing. My guess is for most of us, one way or another, we don't have to imagine that. How is it then that we can go on? How is it that we can still be encouraged? Elijah flees in the midst of this eternal torment, this internal fear. He runs for his life, but cannot escape his fear. He flees for his life from Jezebel, and then in moments later wishes to die. It seems ironic. But when he flees from Jezebel, he realizes that his fear follows him. He cannot escape his fear. He begs God for death. Elijah never denies God, but he certainly questions if following God is worth it anymore. He leaves his servant behind, this true sign of giving up his ministry. Elijah seems to be done with God. He's experiencing this crisis of faith, and God arrives on the scene. In the hero's journey, this is often called the resurrection step. It's the step in which the hero faces their greatest foe. It's bigger than the battle. In Elijah's case, the greatest foe is his own mind, his own fear. And then he receives guidance and deliverance that saves him from the brink of death and produces this new life in him. Look at how God delivers Elijah from his desolate state of mind. 1 Kings 19, 5 through 8. Elijah, he laid down and slept under a broom tree. Behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. He looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and he drank and he laid down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. He arose, he ate, he drank, and went in strength, went in the strength of that food for forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. An angelic meal is what I would call that. Man, I wonder what was in that. I wonder what was in that cake. Was it like fruit? I don't know. Was, what was in the cake? It was delicious. Was it like a sinless cake? Was there no yeast in it? I don't know. It was made on hot stones. How good could it be? But it was. It seemed like God really shows up here for Elijah. What does God do first? Elijah's asleep. You think God wakes him up first? The angel of the Lord cries out, "Elijah, be not afraid." Where he cries out, he goes out, "Elijah." Where were you when God formed the mountains? Where, where's that statement here? Or Elijah, get up and stop complaining. He doesn't do any of that. The first thing God does is make breakfast. Well, I don't know if it was breakfast. Most important meal of the day, so possibly. He lets Elijah sleep, and he cooks a meal. We often tend to think of this passage as God meeting Elijah's need in the short term. But what we have to realize is that throughout the rest of this passage, God is going to be meeting Elijah's need in the short term, in the long term, and beyond that. Because God knows how to minister to the whole person. I think too often we assume that 
What we desire of God is the right here and the right now. But where we end up falling from God is in the later. Because right here and right now, I have my needs. And God may supply those needs right here and right now, but when two weeks from now occur and I don't feel like those needs are being met, suddenly I'm falling from him. Suddenly I'm going, well, God's never really cared about me. It's the moment where Elijah's in the midst of a battle and right there and right now God is working and then he gets to Israel and it doesn't seem like God's working in the way that Elijah has expected of him. And so now he goes, well, I guess God isn't really for me. I throw in the towel. But God knows how to minister to the whole person. He knows how to minister to us in the short term. He knows how to minister to us in the long term. God is great at follow-up. God is great at putting people in our lives that will continuously pour into us and invest us. God has built his church for that very purpose. God will continue to minister to us for forevermore because there is no reason to leave God behind. There's no reason to abandon God because we have a God that will never forsake or abandon us. He knows how to minister to the whole person. Dr. Timothy Keller, he puts it this way. He calls it meeting physical, relational, and spiritual needs. He first meets the physical need. Verse 4 through 8, he himself goes a day's journey into the wilderness. He sits down under the broom tree. He says, God, take my life. I am no better than my father's. He sleeps. The angel touches him. Arise and eat. Twice. The angel of the Lord, arise and eat. He eats, he drinks, and on the strength of that food, he fasts for another 40 days and 40 nights as he travels to Horeb, the mountain of God. God recognizes that Elijah is a physical being. And in order to make this journey to where he is being called, he is going to need rest, and he's going to need food. Elijah, in this incredible moment of depression, in this incredible moment of just being torn down and, be, and being afraid, God shows up and says, it's okay to take a nap, Elijah. It's okay to rest now. You've been working really hard, and it's okay to sleep. It's not just God saying, Elijah, go do the next thing. It's God giving permission to Elijah to rest. And not only that, but a greater rest than that. A rest knowing that the angel of the Lord is by his side. A rest with Jesus. Next thing he meets is the relational need. Because Elijah is not just a physical being, he's also a being created to be in relationship with others. The angel of the Lord rests with him. The angel of the Lord hangs out with him. The angel of the Lord waits with him and makes a second meal. And then further from that, in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 9, there he came to a cave and he lodged in it. In the Hebrew, the cave here is considered possibly a crept, so it's probably a cut out divot in the mountain. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to them, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel. They've forsaken your covenant. They've thrown down your altars. They've killed your prophets with the sword, and I, I'm the only one left. And they wish to kill me. I think I'm done. What does God do? He asks him again later on. He tells Elijah, okay, go, go, go up on the mountain, go out. And he shows up in three different ways, and then he shows up in a voice, and the first thing he says to Elijah again is, why are you here? And he allows Elijah to vent one more time. God meets Elijah's relational need by listening to him. He asks him a question in verse 9. He asks it again in verse 13. What we know about Scripture is that God often doesn't ask us questions because he wishes to learn something from us. Instead, God asks a question because he wishes to teach us something. He asks Elijah twice. Most likely, the first answer to what are you doing here is Elijah just giving a progress report. But the second answer would demand greater reflection, and the fact that Elijah says the same thing verbatim tells us a lot more about what's going on in Elijah's head. tells us where he's struggling. It's uh, Elijah's stubborn fearfulness. 
Because if, if anything about Elijah's character hasn't changed, it's the fact that he's stubborn. Two times he says that Israel has disobeyed and that he was faithful. The first, that progress report, but the second indicates a greater reflection. Because Elijah lets us in on his lack of faith because he assumes that God would make it so that Israel would obey. The first time I'm telling you this because that's how I got here. The second time I'm telling you this is because you screwed up the plan. The first time is Israel disobeyed, and that's why I'm here. The second is because it's your fault, God. I have been very jealous for the Lord. A statement at first, a position of how he's literally here in this spot. I'm jealous for you, so I'm following. I'm here. The second time, a statement of pride showing how Elijah assumed that his work was God's plan. God, I did my part. I was jealous for you. I had the best program. This is something we say in ministry. I had the best program. I had the best plan. Oh, man, I knew exactly what I needed to put in services. I knew exactly how much worship songs to do. I knew exactly how many things to say in the, in the sermon. I prepared so well, and then I preached it, and no one cared. Ugh, your fault, God. You didn't show up. I went to church, and I didn't feel the presence of the Holy Spirit amongst his people. So obviously, God wasn't there. This is Elijah's complaint. I did my part. I had the best Bible study. Everybody else, they don't know scripture, but I know scripture. I had the best plan. You were supposed to hop on board with my plan, God, and Israel would obey. I did my part. You are the one that failed me, you see? You see, Elijah looks at his plans and not only does he assume that God is going to jump on board, but Elijah looks at his plans as if they are God. Elijah looks at the outcome as if that is God. He looks at the expectation and goes, that's where God's going to be. That is God. And when he doesn't get to there, then he goes, God's not there. God's not here. That isn't God. I can't trust God. Instead of admitting that it was his own concept, of what he thought would happen, Elijah assumes instead that he was right all along and it was God that let him down. You see, a concept of God that is of our own making, no matter how beautiful it is we dream up, it's still a limitation on God and it's a box that we put him in. It's interesting because in our current postmodern world, there, there's no real denial of God's existence. It's rather a rejection of God's existence that we see. Um, it, it's uh, this idea that there is an I, there is something out there. Uh, it, it's become all the more pro uh, prominent in today's world where people who want to identify with religion, the nuns that, ex that are growing and growing, the idea of people who identify with nothing, no religion, no affiliation of any faith, yet a as equally prominent is the idea of spirituality. You can go up to somebody and say, oh, do you go to church? And they'll say, no, I would never step foot in church. But if you ask them if they're spiritual, I bet you they would say, yeah, I mean, I, I dabble a little bit. I, I read my horoscopes every now and again. And I, you know, I, I, like, to, I like to consider that my, my mental health is extremely prioritized. And they consider all these things spiritual things. You can go up to someone and ask them about their faith, and they would deny you all day long. But if you went up and asked someone if they were a spiritual person, everybody might say yes. It's weird, but it's common all the more reason that we can minister to people, isn't it? I'm a spiritual person too. My spirituality is in Jesus, yet we don't go there. We go to the place of, oh, well, you're not a real spiritual person. You're just a physical and relational being. You're not a spiritual being like me. But God knows how to minister to the whole person, shouldn't we? In the modern era, this is a quote from Tim Keller. In the modern era, the question was, can I believe in God? But in the postmodern era, the question is, which God do I believe in? Uh, I mentioned the opening ceremony at the Olympics. There was a moment there where it seemed like a bunch of 
people who were in the performance decided that they needed to go against the grain of whatever it was that their director was telling them to do and wanted to make a mockery of Jesus in some way or fashion. We don't know if that was their full intention, but it was what they displayed, and a lot of Christians have been a little mad about this. And by a little mad, I mean very mad about this. Isn't it interesting that there's no denial of God in that, but it is a rejection of God in that? Is it an interesting that the rejection of God is displayed not as a God doesn't exist, so I reject him, but instead a God exists and I don't like him because I don't think he likes me. If you stare at the image of that, if you look at what these people are portraying in this moment, they're portraying that they can be their own gods because God who is doesn't seem to be for them. And if God hates me, why would I ever love him? In this world, we don't look at a God and say, do you exist? We say, which one do we believe in? For a lot of us, the God we believe in is ourselves. Sometimes it's our finances. Sometimes it's our family. Sometimes our God is our success. It's our plans. Sometimes we, we claim to be monotheistic meaning that we believe in one God above all. But we live as though our plans, our finances, ourselves, our ideas, they're greater than God is, and so we are monotheists in proclamation, but polytheists in practice. I believe in Jesus, but I don't let Jesus touch my finances. I believe in Jesus, but I won't let him touch that area of my life where I'm in sin. I believe in Jesus, but I don't think he agrees with me on this, and so I'm going to throw out that part of the Bible. I believe in Jesus, but I don't believe in this part of it. I, I think that this thing is more important than my belief in Jesus. And suddenly we're monotheists in proclamation, but we're polytheists in practice. I worship Jesus, and I also worship my finances. I worship Jesus, and I also worship my family. I worship Jesus, and I also worship my successes. I worship Jesus, and I also worship. And we say we worship Jesus, but we live as though we worship everything else and Jesus. And isn't God a jealous God? Elijah's fears have become greater than his faith. And these are the things that, that lead us to, they, they, they allow us to wish and want for death. The moment where Elijah says, God, take my life, I'm done. Elijah has this incredible fear of man, this fear of oh, well, God, if I keep following you, I'm going to die anyways, so might as well take me now. It's this moment where Elijah looks to God. And it's interesting to me that even in this moment of absolute desolation, even in this moment of absolutely just being so, so sad, Elijah doesn't take his own life, but asks for God to take it. There's still a moment where Elijah believes that it isn't even his right to take his own life. It still belongs to God. There are things that Elijah values more than his fear, but his fear is leading him to beg for death. His fear leads him to these three things, these three lies that fear of man tells us. It tells us that I am forsaken. God, they have killed all of your prophets. I am alone. tells us that we are failures. God, the Israelites do not obey. God, I've chased after you. I am jealous for you. And look, nothing to show for it. God, I'm an obedient servant. And look, nothing. I am a failure. And lies of the fear of man tells us as I am finished. God, they're not doing anything, so obviously the plan's failed. Obviously I'm done. It's the moment where we say, God, I'm all alone. God, I keep messing up. And so, God, you can't use me, can you? Elijah's fear leads him to have this limited idea of God. He starts believing that he's alone out there. He says, God, I'm all that's left. But we see the encouragement that God brings him when God meets the spiritual need. In meeting the spiritual need, God meets Elijah's needs by addressing each of his fears. He tells him, Elijah, you're not finished. 
Elijah, you still have a purpose. You still have a calling to fulfill. You're not a failure. My plan is not finished. I'm still working for the good of those who are called according to his purpose, Romans 8, 28. What a wonderful way to look at that passage. A passage that for some of us in great turmoil can be really hard to accept. A passage that tells us, well, God's going to keep doing good. Can you imagine someone who's in great turmoil for you to go up to them and say, well, don't worry, it's all going to be good one day. I don't know if they'll receive it well. It's a hard verse. But what a wonderful perspective to say, no matter where I'm at in life right now, I know that God is still working. I know that God's plan is not done. Too often in the moment of great tragedy, we look at it and we go, God's plan must have ended here. But what we know, the truth is that God's plan will continue and keep going because God's will is not finished yet. Elijah is not alone. There's this remnant that God is preserving still in Israel. 7,000 Israelites, a people that have not bowed to idols or kissed the golden calf. You see, too often we like to jump to these certain conclusions when people around us face difficulty in life, especially we Christians. We, we tend to hyper-spiritualize things. This is the part where we forgo the idea of ministering to the whole person and we jump to the spiritual side of the person. We turn it into a prayer issue or a faith issue or a theology issue. We Christians will focus so much on the spiritual side of things that we forget that we are physical relational beings as well as spiritual we focus on the other needs too great with an emphasis as well. There's times where we focus solely on the physical or solely on the relational besides just the spiritual. It, it's the person who presumes the issue is merely a biological chemistry issue with your brain. So you have to take a pill to fix your anxiety or take a pill to fix your depression or take a pill to fix your whatever. But they'll never recommend prayer or fasting. They'll never recommend taking time to rest with Jesus. That would be a person who maybe focuses so much on the physical that they won't focus on anything else and they only minister to a part of the person. It's the person who focuses only on the relational that says, well, you just need to talk about it. Well, have you talked about it yet? Have you told somebody about this yet? Are you talking about it yet? But they would never consider the other areas of ministry. And then it's the hyper-spiritual person who asks, well, have you prayed about it yet? Have you read your Bible about this yet? And then when you answer, yes, I actually have, I've been trying to figure out where God is in this, then the issue is no longer if you're doing the right things, it's rather you don't have enough faith because it seems you're doing the right things and God just doesn't care. Have you given this to God? What does your devotional time look like? And then your answers continue to issue with, well, then it must be a faith issue. You just need to pray more. You just need to read your Bible more. You don't go to church enough. You don't spend enough time with God. You don't really love God enough in the way that you're living for him. And so obviously, whatever turmoil you're going through, you probably deserve it. It's not how we voice it in the moment, but it's what is heard. And this person would never consider the chemistry that goes into the physical need. This person would never consider the relational aspect of maybe you do need to see a therapist. Hear me out. I'm not advocating against any of the approaches. I'm not advocating against physical, relational, spiritual. I'm advocating for all three. Because if we as Christians are only advocating for one approach and not ministering to the whole person who is a physical, relational, and spiritual being, then we are failing them. Sometimes you don't need to pray about it. Sometimes you need to rest. Sometimes you need to sleep. Sometimes you need a good meal. Sometimes you need a vacation. Sometimes you need to read a good book that isn't the Bible. It's just a nice fictional book that gets your cares away. Not a self-help book. I don't like those. Sometimes, sometimes you just need to go hang out with friends. Sometimes you just need to be amongst the church in ways that aren't at church. Perhaps we need that more than we realize. <laughs> Sometimes we need devotion and time of devotion that is with people who are of God and not always with God himself. Because, you know, if we're gathered with him, he's there. So why would we think, well, it's just got to be him and me, him and me, him and me. And when it's him and me, I'm advocating for one area, but I'm not going to the others. I am a spiritual being first and nothing else. And I wonder why I'm still upset. I wonder why I'm still unhealthy. 
I wonder why I can do incredible spiritual things. I can pray for people. I can see wonderful things happening in other people's lives. I can minister to people. I can do all these wonderful things. I can go and I can, maybe I can preach a sermon or maybe I can lead a Bible study or maybe I can meet one-on-one with someone and have this incredible moment of mentorship and then I go home and I'm sad. And I go home and I'm alone and I go home and I think I'm a failure and I go home and I think that I'm done. And then I go out the next day and I try it all over again and I become this incredible spiritual being who's doing all these wonderful things, but I don't care about my health. I don't care about my relationships. And I go home and I'm alone. I go home and I'm a failure. I go home and I'm nothing. I go home and I'm done. And then I go out the next day and I say, okay, today I'm going to a different Bible study. And so that different Bible study is going to fix everything. And so I'm going to jump into this Bible study and I'm going to say, okay, God, you're going to show up here. And whoa, man, what wonderful, what wonderful creational things that we're talking about. Oh man, we're having such a great conversation. And then I go home and I'm still alone. And I go home and I'm still afraid. And I go home and I'm still depressed because I think that I need to minister only to one side of me. But in the reality is God doesn't minister to just one part of you. He ministers to the whole person forever. When we walk with him in glory at the end of all days, we walk as physical beings because God doesn't stop ministering to the physical. God doesn't stop relating to us here. Stop thinking of yourself as only one side of a whole person. Ministering to the whole person is acknowledging that they may not need prayer in the moment. They might need a nice meal, solid nap, good company. We have to get this if we make ourselves out to be the best spiritual dietitians that know exactly what every person needs, we tend to be let down all the more when God doesn't measure up to our expectations because we assume our plan is his will. Elijah proclaims this very issue when he states, I'm all that's left. I'm the only faithful one, God. No one's listening to me. Often we assume it's because nobody's listening to us that nobody is listening to God, a symptom of the proclaimed monotheist practicing polytheist. You are not God. I am not God. I don't want people to listen to me. I want people to listen to him. And I want people to listen to him instead of me. Let God be God and submit to his will, a will of God that does not need to appear or bend to your expectation of him, but instead can appear in just a simple and still small voice, a whisper. Here's the truth that the fear of God tells us. I am who he says I am. It's the truth that the fear of God tells us that although I might feel as though I am alone, I have his people to hold me accountable. I have his people to be in my life. Even though I feel like I'm a failure, I have everything that God has provided me on this earth so that he may continue ministering to me physically, relationally, and spiritually. I have people I can talk to. I have doctors I can consult. I have his church. I have the Bible. I have all of it. Because I am who he says I am. I am not a failure. I am not a fraud. I am not someone who is alone. I am not forsaken. I am not finished. And in this moment, we see this next point. Yahweh, who was once proven by a miracle, is now proven by his ministry. It's the moment where God shows up in Elijah's life and he doesn't show up simply as a God who says, oh, well, hey, I'm going to feed you. But he shows up as a God who says, I'm going to feed you. I'm going to hang out with you. I'm going to listen to you. And then I'm going to talk to you. And when I talk to you, I'm going to lift you up and give you this incredible calling. I'm going to lift you up and tell you all that you need to do. I'm going to lift you up and tell you that my plan's not over yet. I'm going to lift you up and I'm going to say, hey, we're not done. Hey, you're not alone. There's 7,000 left in Israel. Hey, there's people you still need to work with. Your job isn't finished yet. My plan never stopped. Yahweh is proven by his ministry and his ministry to the whole person. It's the unexpected call to lean in. It's the moment where God turns to Elijah and he says, hey, I'm going to show up. I want you to go out of this cave. I've asked you already where you've been. Now I want you to, I want you to leave this crypt. I want you to leave this side of the mountain. I want you to just get out of here. 
and Elijah doesn't leave. He, he waits in there. Do you notice this? In the passage, it says that Elijah is told to go out, but then the wind and the earthquake and the fire come, and he doesn't, sh- earth, wind, and fire, weird coincidence. Um, <laughs> Elijah doesn't go out. I wonder if Elijah went to this cave in September. No. Um, <laughs> that was a dumb joke. Um, Elijah doesn't go out. He's afraid. He's afraid of the wind. He's afraid of the earthquakes. He's afraid of the fire. You know, each of these three appearances of God before his presence is found in the whisper, remind Elijah of God. Um, remind Elijah of the God that he serves. Three instances, God reminds Elijah, I am the God of the earthquakes, I am a God of the winds, and I am the God of the flames. Even the location, Horeb, the mountain of God, more commonly known as Mount Sinai, the mountain Moses first met with God in Exodus 3 and 4, the mountain where God established his covenant relationship with the people of Israel by his law in Exodus 20 through 24. We're not in Exodus, but we're in Exodus. The same mountain, and according to the Hebrew language, highly likely the same cave or crept of the mountain where God famously reveals his glory to Moses in Exodus 34, is the cave and crept where Elijah stands there talking to God. The same one. Elijah would know this. He would remember that the God of the earthquake, the God of the wind, the God of the fire is the God of Moses, is the God of Israel, is the God of Elijah, and all of this is leading to God's voice. His word, the most important thing Elijah will ever hear, and it isn't a voice that's profound. It isn't a voice that's loud. It isn't a voice that's echoing through the fire. It's not a voice that's echoing through the mountain. It's not a voice that's echoing through the clouds. It's not a voice that happens to show up in the case of a sermon. It's not a voice that is this plea for Elijah's repentance. It's not a voice that is this loud outburst of condemnation. Where were you when I formed? It isn't even an inside voice shout. Hey, it's a whisper. It's a whisper that changes Elijah's whole world. My third point is this, the word that remains in a whisper. First thing here is God is remembered. God's call on Elijah, his proclamation of the remnant in Israel reveals that his word found in the whisper cannot be silenced. It will continue to be proclaimed. Hazael is a pagan king. In 1 Kings 19.15, the Lord said to him, Go return to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And God says, I still have people in Israel. God says, I still have people in Syria. I'm going to have my people in Syria under Hazael, this pagan king. I'm going to use Hazael in a mighty way. Imagine how much bigger God would become in your eyes if you started believing that he can use people in the Catholic Church to do his will. Imagine how much bigger God would become in your eyes if you started believing that it isn't theology that makes the believer useful, but the faith. Imagine how much bigger God would become in your eyes if you stopped thinking of the church as divided into a great many denominations. Oh, well, over there, they're pagans because they don't believe this about the millennium. that the church is divided into a great many denominations that all hate each other and started believing that this church is united. You started believing the church is united by a common belief in Christ, the risen son of the triune God who died on the cross for our sins, who sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven as his spirit works in the hearts of man now on this earth. How much bigger would your God become? The spirit works in each denomination wherever God's people are. We are not a divided church. We are a united church ministering across many denominations. A whisper. God speaks in a whisper, which is the word of grace. Why grace? Why does God's whisper have to do with grace? It happens when Elijah is kept from going out. God calls him to go out, but he doesn't go out. Behold, the Lord passes by, strong wind towards the mountain. The Lord's not in the wind. After the wind, the earthquake. The Lord was in the earthquake. Elijah doesn't go out. He waits for the whisper. He stands and he waits and the earthquake comes and the winds come and the fire comes. Not until he hears that still small voice, the whisper of the Lord, does Elijah go out? How is it that Elijah is not destroyed? How is it that he's not shaken by the earthquake or blown from the mountain by the wind or burned to ash by the fire? The fire that comes down from heaven in 1 Kings 18, not Exodus, 
Is a fire that consumes an altar of sacrifices, wood, stone, all wet enough with enough water to sustain close to a thousand people. Yet, in this moment, it doesn't even reach Elijah. He's shielded. The wind comes and it shatters this rock that shields Elijah from the wind, from the earthquakes, from the flames. There's three key signals here of God's wrath and judgment. Earthquakes, winds, fires. And they're all taken by this rock so that Elijah can step into the presence of God and hear a word of grace. Jesus likens himself to a rock in Matthew 7. He says, Everyone will hear these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on the house, but it did not fall because it was founded on the rock. See, God's word, this next point, is it's greater than a miracle. It's not the voice of God that draws Elijah near to him. It's not the signs of the earthquake. People see a miracle, but they don't follow because it's not the miracle that calls us to submit our lives to the will of God. It's his word. Miracles only emphasize the word of God. But if God's word is not present in the miracle, then the miracle is pointless. In the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, Jesus teaches when a rich man begs Abraham to send his servant Lazarus as a spirit or a ghost to warn his family, Abraham says this, Luke 16, 29. Abraham said, they have Moses, they have the prophets, let him hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And Abraham replies, he said to him, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, the word of God, scripture, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. It is not a miracle that turns hearts of stone to hearts of flesh. It is the voice of God. It is his word. My final point is this. Elijah's last stand with Jesus. It's a moment of grace that is all culminative in this. Matthew 17, verses 1 through 5. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother. He led them to this high mountain by themselves. And when he was transfigured before them, his face shone like the sun. His clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, the two from the mountain, talking with him. Peter says to Jesus, Lord, it's good we're here. If you wish, I'll make three tents. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Peter is still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadows them, and the voice from the cloud says, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Elijah and Moses both show up at this moment with the transfigured Christ, two men who have stood on the mountain of God, heard the voice of God, now stand with the Son of God and proclaim that Jesus is the eternal Logos, the Word of God. More than this, two men who have been shielded from the wrath of God's judgment stand with Christ, who is the rock that takes the cup of wrath in exchange for the cup of grace. That is his spirit delivered to us. What does the voice of God say in this moment? Listen to him. Last thing, Elijah seeks death. And instead he finds life in Christ. Why does Elijah not end it himself? He begs God to kill him. But he doesn't take any action. Because even in Elijah's lowest moment, he doesn't believe that it's his right to take his own life. That solely belongs to God. When God speaks... Listen, because his word will give you life. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for this story in 1 Kings 19. Thank you that you have blessed us with an incredible hero's tale, a journey that we can follow through, that we can be encouraged by, that we know that even in our darkest times, you are there to minister to us. You are there to provide our physical need. You are there to listen to us and care for us that when we go to you in prayer, we know that you are on the other side listening. You haven't hung up. You're there. You hear us. You hear our cries. Meet us in our relational need. Meet us in our spiritual need, Lord, as we devote our time to you, as we follow you, as we live in obedience to you. Remind us that your plan is not finished yet, that all that you've done in Christ is all that ever needs to be done, and everything you're doing in your church is culminating to the moment where he will return. God, he hasn't here yet, so we know that you're still working. Let us be encouraged that you are still working, Lord. Let us be encouraged that you have not given up on us. Let us be encouraged that we are not failures, we are not forsaken, we are not alone. That we have you that you have called us, that we have purpose, that we have the church, that we have your bride to lean into, to listen to us, to minister to us, that we will never be alone. Thank you, Jesus. 
And this we pray in your name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you, and give you grace and peace forevermore. Amen.